14 million people are diagnosed with cancer each year. 8.2 million of these people die, making the fatality rate for cancer a brutal 59%. In the case that everyone in this audience had cancer, this would mean that over half of the audience would die. Although treatments such as chemotherapy and radiation are becoming more effective in the treatment of cancer, the rates of cancer are not decreasing nonetheless. In fact, the worldwide rate of cancer is projected to increase up to 60% by 2030. This is a sad truth regarding cancer, as although treatments are becoming more effective, the rate of getting cancer once and getting cancer again after one form of treatment is increasing more rapidly than ever. I personally know the impact cancer can have on a family, as my own grandmother was diagnosed with a brain tumor in 2000, and again with breast cancer in 2012. Cancer can have a toll on a person's family as well as chemotherapy can have a toll on a person's own physical body. Therefore, it is important to evaluate forms of treatment that are superior to treating cancer than traditional forms of treatment available. Which brings us to the topic of my talk, somatic gene therapy in the treatment of cancer, a revolutionary yet controversial method for the treatment of cancer. Cancer is incomparable to any object or thing. It simply occurs when bodily cells grow or multiply too fast and do not die, leading to an overconsumption of the body's limited nutrients. Death. The most common forms of treatment for cancer are chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, and often a combination of the three. However, gene therapy, which was approved by the FDA in 2017, is a relatively new technology that aims to treat cancer from within. There are three types of gene therapy being experimented with in the treatment of cancer. The first two are the use of oncolytic agents and gene transfer. And the third and most important is the use of immunotherapy, which essentially aims to strengthen the immune system. Immunotherapy aims to boost the immune system so that it is better at detecting cancer and therefore killing it. During the process, immune cells are extracted from the patient's body. And in a lab environment, they are altered to better detect cancer. These altered cells are then infused back into the body in the hopes that the body itself will be better, at, uh, better able to detect cancer. In terms of a real world example, imagine your child and you do not know that yellow frogs are dangerous. If your mother hands you a card with a picture of a yellow frog on it, captioned danger, then you will be better at detecting yellow frogs and therefore avoiding danger. In terms of cancer, you, and your, you, you are yourself or immune cells. The yellow frogs are cancer, and the card your mother hands you, which makes you better detect cancer, is gene therapy. Except in a real world situation, you would have to kill yellow frogs, but let's not do that. Although the scenario may seem ideal, gene therapy is far from perfect, and therefore must be evaluated in the context of the 2017 approval of gene therapy for the treatment of cancer. The first type of gene therapy approved by, for cancer was the use of Chimerea, produced by the pharmaceutical company Novartis on August 30, 2017. Chimerea aims to treat patients between the ages of 3 to 25 who have acute lymphoblastic leukemia. In fact, acute lymphoblastic leukemia is the most common childhood cancer within the United States, as approximately 3,100 patient, uh, patients under the age of 20 are diagnosed annually. The trials preceding the approval of Chimerea were extremely successful, with a rate of remission of 83% over a three-month period, although it does come with risks and a high cost of $475,000. It must be considered, however, that the most common form of treatment for, can uh, for leukemia, a bone marrow transplant, can cost anywhere between $540,000 to $800,000, a cost that is much higher than that of gene therapy, but widely used nonetheless. Furthermore, a Novartis spokesperson stated that since the treatment is aimed at those between the ages of 3 to 25, most would either be covered by their parents' insurance or by government Medicaid, therefore possibly justifying the high costs of Chimerea. The second treatment approved by the FDA was the use of the Ascarda on October 18, 2017, produced by the pharmaceutical company Kite Pharma. The Ascarda aims to treat patients with a certain type of lymphoma who have relapsed after or have not responded to at least two other forms of treatment. In fact, the rate of remission after receiving two forms of treatment is approximately 10%. So many patients approach Yascarda as a last option for living. Uh, nevertheless, um, the 
trials preceding the approval of the Escarda showed a rate of remission of approximately 51%, showing its relative success despite its high cost and risks. The one risk worth mentioning with both the Escarda and Chimera is the development of cytokine release syndrome. Cytokine release syndrome occurs um, as when cells die, they release this protein called cytokine. And in the case of gene therapy, when a lot of cells die, a lot of cytokine is released into the body, which can therefore result in a very high fever and trouble breathing. In fact, in trials preceding the approval of Chimera, 70% of patients develop cytokine release syndrome, and therefore it is important to evaluate it when one decides whether to receive gene therapy or not. However, to combat cytokine release syndrome, the FDA imposed a risk evaluation and mitigation program alongside the approval of both the Escarda and Chimera, which ensures that two doses of tocilizumab, a steroid, are available per patient uh, who receives gene therapy, as well as that personnel at each facility who administer um, gene therapy are trained in treating neurotoxicity as well as cytokine release syndrome, therefore possibly justifying um, the, co the use of the Escarda and Novartis despite its risks. When one, when one decides to receive gene therapy, one must also evaluate other forms of treatments that are available in the treatment of cancer, which is chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, and often a combination th of the three. Although widely used, chemotherapy and radiation affect all fast-growing cells within the body instead of only targeting cancerous cells the way gene therapy does. Going back to the example of the infamous frog, this would mean that you would be scared of all yellow objects instead of being scared of only yellow frogs. Again, in terms of cancer, you are yourself and the yellow objects are all cells within your body. And instead of being scared of only yellow frogs, you're scared of all yellow objects, much like how chemotherapy and radiation target all fast-growing cells within the body instead of targeting only cancerous cells. Being scared all the time exhausts you, doesn't it? This is exactly what chemotherapy and radiation do to your bodily cells. They exhaust them. This exhaustion can be seen in a person's nose bleeding, overall fatigue, and hair falling out. This exhaustion caused to all bodily cells also means that chemotherapy and radiation cannot be implemented for extended periods of time as the body will not be able to accommodate the strain. Again, chemotherapy and radiation target all fast-growing cells within the body, including eggs and sperm. Chemotherapy and radiation may cause infertility or damage to potential offspring. Furthermore, in the case of surgery, which comes with its own risks, some cancers are inoperable due to their location. And some cancers, such as that, that of leukemia, do not benefit from chemotherapy or radiation at all. In fact, less than 5% of cases of leukemia benefit from chemotherapy or radiation. This is such a cancer that benefits more from gene therapy than traditional forms of treatment available. For, however, gene therapy in conjunction with chemotherapy and radiation could yield the best result, as some types of gene therapy make cancer more vulnerable to chemotherapy and radiation, so the patient has to receive chemotherapy and radiation for a less amount of time, therefore affecting all bodily cells and exhausting all bodily cells to a lesser extent. In conclusion, yes, gene therapy should be used in the treatment of certain cancers. The FDA approvals of gene therapy are key examples of cancers that benefit more from gene therapy than traditional forms of treatment available. However, even the FDA approval of gene therapy emphasizes on the fact that gene therapy should only be used as a last option due to its risks. Furthermore, although gene therapy is, although gene therapy is effective on widespread tumors such as that of lymphoma or leukemia, gene therapy has not been as effective on solid tumors such as that of breast cancer, which is the second most common cancer in the United States. Presently, gene therapy should only be used in the treatment of cancers that do not respond to traditional treatments or patients who have received other forms of treatment and have not responded to, to those treatments, or gene therapy should be used in conjunction with traditional forms of treatment to yield the best results. However, in the future, gene therapy could be evolutionary as it, due to its precision and technological superiority to traditional forms of treatment. In the beginning of this talk, I stated that over half of you would die due to cancer in the case that all of you had cancer. Gene therapy has the potential to minimize this loss exponentially and possibly save all lives, uh, possibly save millions of lives from dying from cancer. Thank you.